when you went into Fredonia for school, uh, what were the farm kids' feelings towards town kids? Well, my feeling was, boy, this is a big place. You know, it's just uh, overwhelming compared to a little little schoolroom that we had. You know, it was just all these kids, you know, just uh, like all of a sudden you're, you're a lone ant someplace else and all of a sudden you're in the, in the ant pile. That's what it amounted to him. And all of a sudden here you are, all these people, you don't know anybody. And, you know, it's, they all knew who you were because you were the only one, but you didn't know all the rest of them that were there. So, yeah. What was your family's attitude towards town people? I don't think they had any misgivings about anything like that that I can remember or ever heard. Okay. What were the positive aspects of growing up on a farm? Well, <clears throat> I think it it give you a better outlook as as far as uh, you know where your bread and butter is coming from. Uh, you knew that uh, you needed a cow, you needed to milk that cow in order to get milk, whereas uh, uh, some of the ch people, uh, they have no concept of what, what happens till that uh, bottle of milk is eventually on your table. Uh, I recall an incident uh, many years back where somebody commented about milk. Uh, I think it had to do with milk prices. You know, and then one individual made a comment, hell, he's, we don't need the farmer. He said, we can buy our milk in town. Well, wake up, man. You know, where do you think that milk really comes from? You know, it's, uh, and you have other, other instances like that where people have no concept where, where something comes from. Were there any negative aspects about growing up on a farm? No, I don't think so. Were there any social classes that existed when you were growing up? Not that I'm aware of. Let's switch over to talk a little bit about holidays and celebrations. Uh, what was your favorite holiday? Well, I would say it probably be Christmas. <clears throat> and what was a typical Christmas and Christmas Eve for you? Well, uh, in the early years, <clears throat> uh, as far as the Christmas and the holidays were concerned, uh, as far as, like in today's age, you know, you got Christmas programs and, and church and stuff like that. Uh, in my growing up years, I don't recall that we would go to church for a Christmas program when I was real young, uh, other than a Christmas present, which were probably consisted of a Cracker Jack and maybe a banana or something like that, you know, or, and maybe some little toy, which probably wasn't worth whatever it was, maybe a, a bag of uh, socks maybe or something. <clears throat> it was only in the later years uh, after my mother had passed away that uh, my sister and her husband, uh, the oldest one now, uh, they would go to church in Fredonia. And uh, when Christmas Eve came along or something, and I suppose arrangements were made prior, which I didn't know anything about, but anyway, they would pick us, my, me and my littlest brother, uh, pick us up and take us along to Fredonia to Christmas program. And uh, so that was kind of a you know, big deal. The church was filled, lots of kids around, and Christmas bags, you know, gee, that was kind of neat, I thought. But as far as uh, us going to church uh, to that point, during the summer or whatever, I don't ever recall anything like that. It was only after we moved to Fredonia that uh, my dad uh, took us to church and uh, got going with church business then. Okay. Did your family celebrate Christmas <coughs> Eve at all? Uh, not that I recall, other than one incident when we were all at home. Uh, were the, uh, I don't know which was it, my oldest sister or the second oldest sister, there was a Christmas tree in the, in the living room and it had these uh, candles on it which represented today's lights, so to speak, and these were actual candles. And I don't know why it was, but for some reason my mother and dad sat close by the door which led into the, into the uh, kitchen 
and he had a five gallon pail of water there. And I, as a kid, I didn't know what that was for. But uh, today I know why he had that there. Uh, that particular evening, whenever it was decided, they would light the candles on this Christmas tree. And some, somebody, I'm, I'm guessing my sisters probably, because they were the oldest ones, they would light each individual candle until they were all lit. And boy, that was just as bright as you could see. And, uh, you know, thinking about it now, that was the biggest fire hazard that we had in the, in the house at that time. And that's why Dad had that bucket of water there. And I didn't know that why, but I know it now today. But they didn't leave him on very long. And, and then they put him out again. So, thank goodness. Okay. You mentioned the, the presents you got um, sometimes consisted of food. What type of food did you eat for Christmas dinner? Well, probably chicken and dumplings. Did your family celebrate Easter? Uh, not very often, that I recall. Uh, the, what I recall is uh, being told that Easter's coming, whatever days down the road that they said, uh, you know, make sure you get yourself an Easter basket ready for the Easter rabbit. And, uh, well, you know, what do you hear? Well, here's a paper sack. So you cut the paper sack off the top down to, I don't know, I suppose it had about three or four inches or five inches from the bottom up. You cut it off there. And uh, if it was, uh, the season was such that uh, uh, grass was growing, which was good at that time. So you go out to the pasture and you pick this green grass and, you know, enough, enough grass for the Easter rabbits to lay his eggs in. And, and uh, sometimes the crocuses had flowers, so you'd pick some of those and put them in there. And of course, he had that sitting by the door, you know, that evening. And well, tomorrow morning, the Easter rabbit should have been here. Well, a lot of times he was. So. And you got some colored eggs and probably a Cracker Jack or candy cane or something, you know, whatever in those days, whatever was available. But as far as going to church or anything of that, I don't recall. You know, like Easter Sundays or Good Fridays or anything of that, or you know, I don't recall any of that kind of stuff. Okay. <clears throat> and what type of food did you eat for Easter? Uh, probably with noodles and prunes. <clears throat> you mentioned earlier uh, your family maybe going into town for Fourth of July or something. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Can you describe typical Fourth of July for you? Okay, uh, for Fourth of July, the the rule was that all the potatoes had to be hoed, you know, the weeds from the potatoes had to be hoed, and the potato bugs had to be picked in the potato field. You know, that had to be done. Otherwise, you stayed home and did it on the fourth. So you made sure your brothers and sisters and everybody was out there and did that type of thing. And of course, when you got to town, we probably given a quarter. And uh, you know, have fun. So you walked up and down the street and admired what was going on. And, and uh, as far as buying firecrackers, I don't recall that we bought firecrackers or anything like that. Probably an ice cream cone or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> if it was uh, if it was a gackle, uh, everybody would gather at uh, at grandmother's place, and then they had there was lunch there, sandwiches and watermelon and whatever. <coughs> Does your family celebrate birthdays? Uh, not that I recall of. You know, any any big fanfare, other than well, it's it's your birthday, you know, and you now turned uh, five or ten or whatever the case was, you know. Uh, other than that, I, as far as birthday cakes, I don't recall anything like that. Can you tell us about any other holidays that your um, family celebrated during your childhood, such as Halloween or New Year? Well, Thanksgiving. We had Thanksgiving dinners. Uh, not any great big fanfares or anything like that, but there was a Thanksgiving dinner, turkey or something. Had that there. New Year's. Uh, I don't recall that we had anything unusual going on at New Year's. One thing that, uh, that I recall after Mother passed away, uh, as far as prayer is concerned, uh, prior to that, I don't recall anything like that either.
But it was after her mother passed away that my dad, apparently the spirit moved him to uh, move into spiritual thoughts to have a prayer uh, in the morning, uh, an evening before you go to bed. Uh, we did. I do recall having having a table prayer for every you know noon and evening stuff like that. I remember that, and that was a German prayer, of course. And uh, but other than that, and as for reading the Bible, he would do it, do that quite regularly after Mom had passed away. So. Do you remember the German prayer? No, oh, gosh. Come out of ye, Jesus, say, no one's a ghost. Uh, it's part of it. Let's see what else. It's the rest of it. There's there's more to it yet. It's kind of like the Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Let us food us be blessed. But it's in German. Uh, I just don't recall right off the cuff how you say it in German, the last part of it. Well, whatever it is. <clears throat> okay. Uh, speaking of religion, let's uh, turn to religion. Um, okay, turning to religion, how important was religion during your childhood? Well, for me, I didn't know anything about it, so it didn't, you know, it's not that I brushed it off, because I just, I just didn't know. Uh, it was only, like I mentioned earlier, when we moved to Fredonia into town, uh, that we started going to church, and that was the current congregational church at that time. So we went to Sunday school, and got going from there. <coughs> How often did you attend church once you started to go? Every Sunday. Yes, Sunday school, that was a, a main thing. Got to go to Sunday school. Could you tell us about the seating arrangements at the church? Uh, the ladies were sitting on the uh, uh, left side, and the men were on the right side. What were some of the religious activities that you participated in? Well, at Christmas time, you were in the Christmas program. And how to how to participate? Uh, you know, you had a part in the in the program, which I had that. Uh, yeah. As far as choir or anything like that, I was too young, and I don't even recall that there was a choir in that congregational church at that time. Were you baptized and or confirmed? I was baptized in the Lutheran Church. Uh, during the time I was going to high school. And what was the other question you asked? Uh, confirmation. Uh, confirmation. That was kind of a, a together type of a thing. Because I was an adult, so to speak, when I was confirmed and baptized at the same time. Okay. Um, for those, did you learn in English or German books? No, that was all English stuff. Oh. Did, you have a, did your family have a celebration after you confirmed? No, no. The only celebration I had, uh, I don't know, you can't even call it a celebration, but I got a Bible from my oldest sister that has my name imprinted on the front side of it, which I thought was pretty neat. It's got a zipper around the outside, you know, to keep it closed. It should be open all the time. <clears throat> Were you able to question religious teachings? No, that didn't even come up. To me, church was church. You know, I didn't... If it would have been Baptist church or Catholic church or something, I probably wouldn't have known the difference, but uh, there really isn't too much difference. We're all going, trying to go to the same place using a different vehicle. Some vehicles are more expensive than other vehicles. Did your parents restrict anything because of religion? No. Dad didn't say anything. Um, was your Sunday dinner or supper different from supper from any other days of the week? Well, Sundays usually was a noodle soup, chicken noodle soup usually, and maybe a sandwich once in a while, a bologna sandwich. Okay. Was the German language ever used in church? Uh, early on, when we went to Fredonia to the Congregation Church, 
they had German services uh, one Sunday, as I remember, or else, or else it was once a month on, in, in a given month. Uh, and then the rest of the three Sundays or four Sundays, however it came about, were then in English. But that, that didn't last in very, I mean, it might have been going on for many years prior to that, but after I, I recall anything of it, it didn't, it didn't last very long. <clears throat> How did your family respond and react towards death? Sad situation. Yeah, we were all pretty much sad. Neighborhood and everything was sad. Here's my mother passing away at 44 years old, you know, and leaving behind uh, the, the five children. Uh, one of them was married, of course, by that time, but uh, the rest of us weren't. Uh, could you describe <coughs> a typical funeral? Well, uh, my mother's funeral, as an example. Uh, when uh, whoever it was that got the telegram from Rochester uh, to tell the family at home that uh, mom had passed away, uh, I don't know anymore who it was that drove from our place uh, to grandma's place to another aunt's place to another aunt's place to they drove there was no telephone those days they drove to spread the word that uh, sister had passed away and my mother and uh, dad was going to accompany the body home by train and uh, I don't know it was a day or two or three later whatever it was all of a sudden here one day uh, the funeral the director with his hearse came to the farmyard and uh, so then they brought the body into the house, uh, in the casket, and doors must have been wide enough to get through. So, uh, they uh, had her <clears throat> in one of the rooms, which they always said that was the coldest room in the house. I really don't know if it was or not, but anyway, they said that was the coldest room in the house, so they had her in that particular room. And then uh, whatever the undertaker told my dad and my sisters and brother, and probably whoever else, whoever ever else was there, they mentioned, you know, this and this and this and this is what you do. Uh, it wasn't too long after that. In fact, I think that evening, uh, neighbors started showing up, you know, to view the body and things of that nature. And that, I don't know, that must have went on maybe about two days, three days maybe at the most. I don't know. It wasn't just too long. And uh, the day of the funeral was a cold, windy day. Uh, the funeral director was there with, his, with the hearse and the, the casket was carried out and uh, I didn't know at the time until it was pointed out to me here not so many years ago that uh, the flower, there were flower girls, girls that carried flowers, you know, just like Paul Bears carried the casket, there was girls that carried flowers and uh, I have a picture of that now where that activity is at the front of the house when the body was already in the casket, but there were some pictures taken, so I have some of that stuff. And uh, then the uh, funeral was held in the Congregational Church in Gackle. And uh, of course the burial was done in Gackle Cemetery. And that was on the, uh, in October of 1947. I understand you have a couple hymn books you'd like to show us? Yeah, I got a few of them here. <clears throat> Here's a, a song book that my mother's uh, name is imprinted in here, her maiden name, Otelli Schlecht. And uh, calling it the the uh, Gesangbuch, Gesangbuch, and the uh, Congregational Gemeinden, you know, and uh, there aren't any notes in it as such. Uh, apparently, the person who played the organ, if they if they had any organ music, uh, or some of the people probably even knew this stuff by heart, and so you know, page so and so, whatever it was, and they would they would sing this particular page, and it's all in German, every bit of it, and. The unique thing is my mother's name is imprinted on it. And then we've got a little book here. <clears throat> it's, uh, you can't really tell what the imprint is on the front page here, 
but uh, it's a it's like a little prayer book, a morning prayer book and an, an, you know, an evening prayer book. And uh, my dad's got his name written in here, and that's all in German. You know, there's different prayers in here for. Well, I don't know. If, I don't think it even says what what day or anything like that. It's just you know, you go from one to the next, from one to the next, and keep on going like that. Uh, here's another one with my mother's name in it, and uh, this is a songbook that has notes on it now. Must be a modern one by now. I don't know if there's even a date on this here. 1925, copyright. Going back to this one, here's our date on this one. 1917. On this one to the copyright, 1917. So they've got a few, a few years on them already. <coughs> uh, this booklet here, a larger book here, is a uh, booklet that was used for the, uh, uh, the church council president, is what we know it today. Uh, in those early days, it probably was called the oldest lay reader or somebody in the church who was the head of the church, so to speak, other than the pastor. Uh, when the pastor wasn't at the, uh, wasn't at the church that particular Sunday because he was probably at another church, <clears throat> no doubt the pastor told this person that this coming Sunday, you read page such and so and so and so, and this is what this was. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, a reading book for the pastor, or for the lay persons to read in the absence of the pastor. And that's all in German. That's, let's see, what is the copyright on this one? This is, uh, uh, I would say this is 1889. It's in German, so I'm not sure exactly if that if this is what it reads copyright, but there's a date on it, 1889, on two different pages here. In any of the services that you ever attended, was there a person such as that? Not that I'm aware of. If there was, I was probably too little to even know what was going on. Uh, This copyright book here is 1906, and uh, there's no notes on this here, but I I'm suspecting it's probably a songbook as well. Yeah, right here is a songbook. It's a songbook. Now, my mother, and I'm sure this is my mother's, well, maybe not. It might be my mother and my dad's writing together. Uh, they have written in here uh, when we kids were born, our names and stuff like that. And this little booklet here was given to my wife. It says, Biblical History for School and Home by Dr. M. Rue. Dubuque, Iowa, 1918. That's older than my wife is. And that's kind of like a storybook, but that's in English. It's Bible stories. Okay. All right. Let's uh, switch from a religion. Let me see one more thing. Okay. My dad's Bible. Oh, yes. I forgot about this one here. That's a German Bible. Uh, let's see. Must be so old they don't have no date in it. But that's all in German too. And my dad, I remember my dad having this uh, on the kitchen table and reading from this here many, many times after mom had passed away. Many times. Yeah.
did he always have German language um, items for religion? Did he ever use English? Uh, I think he could read some English, but he was comfortable with German. Okay. Yeah, he was comfortable with German. I'm really surprised I don't see no date in this thing here. Die Bibel, die Heilige Schrift. Alten und Neuen Testament. Old and New Testament. That's the Bible, the Holy Scripture. Old and New Testament. That's what that is. Oh, here it is. 1819. 18, uh, 18, no, I don't believe that's right. But it's, there's a print in here, a little stamp. It says 1819 here. I can't believe that would be 1819. Well, uh, whatever it is. Okay. All right. Moving from religion kind of back to your um, growing up on farm life, um, let's talk a little bit about the chores that you had to do. Oh, we had a guy that did eggs. I had to feed the piggies. I had to feed the calves. And when I was old enough, I even had to do milking. Well, the worst part was cleaning the chicken barn on Saturdays. Oh, gosh. I don't know if you ever heard the old story. You had chewing gum, you lost it twice before you thought you had it. Ugh, when I even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> How often would you have to do your chores? Well, that was the morning and the evening thing, every day. You know? Of course, the chickens don't lay eggs during the night, so, so you're only gather the chicken uh, eggs in the evening. But as far as feeding the animals, that was, you know, those that were pinned up. Uh, you had to feed them in the morning and evening, just like, like always. Okay. Did you have to do anything around the house, such as cooking, cleaning, or washing? No cooking, no uh, no cleaning. Well, cleaning, yeah, sweep the floors, uh, dusting, and things like that. And those things all occurred after Mom had passed away when we were growing up as little kids, you know, to, you know, got to clean this here, got to wash that, you know. And uh, Dad used to, usually did the washing and stuff like that. Sometimes my older sister would come to the house and she'd help along. But, uh, yeah, my dad did most of it. Cooked and everything. Did your family have a garden? Oh, yes. We always had a large garden. And did you have any chores in the garden? Got to hoe the weeds. Oh, you bet. And sometimes there was a weed that you missed and for some reason you didn't see it. But Dad saw it. He says, how come you didn't mow, hoe that weed off that's over there? Where? Over there! So you find, he pointed out to you pretty soon, here was a weed that was a foot tall. You didn't hoe that sucker off two weeks earlier. What type of vegetables and fruits did you grow in your garden? Well, carrots, potatoes, cucumbers, cabbages, lettuce, radishes, whatever normal, normal uh, vegetable things are that can be grown. Beets, tomatoes. Before your mother passed away, did your father help with the household tasks? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. See, my, my two older sisters uh, were old enough already where they did all that kind of thing too. How would your family do the laundry when you were growing up? Uh, <clears throat> what I recall is um, it was a ringer washer. Uh, prior to electricity, it had a, a Maytag gas motor on it. And uh, whichever day it was, I am suspecting it probably was on a Monday more than likely because a lot of people wash clothes on Mondays and that probably, we probably did the same thing. And so, uh, uh, this Maytag motor was started and there was a little hole that was drilled out on the windowsill outside, you know, where they stuck this hose through. And of course the exhaust would go out there, but you'd still have some of that exhaust thing in the house. So yeah, it was a ringer washer. And uh, of course when electricity came along, they took that gas motor off of there and replaced it with electric motor. And Ma thought that was the greatest thing there was. Electric washing machine, never heard of such a thing. How did you dry the clothes? They were hung out in lines. Yeah. In the real dead of winter when it was, you know, not feasible to go out, you know, 
and if their washing was done, uh, a lot of those clothes were hung around inside the house. They had a nail in the wall here and a nail in the wall there, and, and they would string. Uh, in those cases, it was called binder twine, and today we'd call it baler twine because that's baler twine is a little stronger and a little, there's a little more substance to it than, than binder twine. So, yeah, that was strung around different places and hung in the house. <clears throat> How often did your family do the laundry? Oh, I'm sure probably once a week. How would you iron your clothes? Uh, they had the old uh, cast iron uh, pieces of iron which looked like an iron uh, with a detachable handle on it and of course uh, these were set on the cook stove and uh, <clears throat> I don't know they must have been put on on the stove in the morning I suppose to get them warmed up and when ironing time came along well then they were hot enough to fastened the handle by mechanically away, I don't know, with a snap or something, and then they took it and did the ironing until it was deemed it was getting too cold. They would put it back on the uh, on the stove again and take the next one and do the same thing. Um, did your mother ever work out in the fields or outside the home? Like oh, yes, I recall some of that, yeah. I recall some of the shocking. I was pretty little at the time, but uh, I was drug along. Uh, Pants were too short in most cases, so you got stubble scratches on your legs, you know, and that hurt. But yeah, you would drug along and helped along with the shocking, what little you could, for as little as you were. How often would you work outside the house? Well, I'm sure during milking time in the morning and evening, that was a normal thing. Everybody kind of worked together, you know. Which chores did you enjoy? Not particularly any of them, but uh, it didn't hurt me either <laughs> to do the chores. Did you have any that you uh, disliked more than any others? Well, the, the taking the manure out of the chicken barn, that was the least favorite of mine. You mentioned earlier you worked at uh, one of your sisters? My oldest sister, yeah. Um, were you ever hired out to work at a neighbor's or any other relatives? No, no. I just uh, was working for them. Okay. <coughs> um, you mentioned earlier having the garden and all the food that you grew. In mm -hmm. What were some of your favorite foods? Oh, carrots. I like them. Peas. Uh, lettuce, I like lettuce when, uh, especially when mother made chicken and dumplings. Uh, I like that lettuce and cream mixture that she put together with these, those little onion tops that were in there and stuff like that. That was really good. A little vinegar. Still like that today. Let's talk a little bit here about um, your daily life. Could you tell me um, a little bit about the house that you grew up in, such as how many rooms did it have and where you slept? Okay, the house on the farmstead that I remember <clears throat> uh, was not a very big house, but it was a, a square uh, and had two floors, main floor and the second floor. Uh, the main floor consisted of the kitchen and the living room and uh, uh, two bedrooms. Uh, the bedrooms were not like a square bedroom normally would probably be. They were kind of narrow and long, but they were wide enough for a bed to be in and uh, maybe about two feet, three feet between the bed and the wall that you could walk down to the other end. They were both like that. Uh, the upstairs had uh, two bedrooms and uh, because of the design of the roof there was a third room which was used as a junk room kind of uh, I don't ever recall that there was ever a bed in there but the other two rooms had beds in them where the my sisters and my brother and some of us were in and the heating was such in the winter time if you had a glass of water upstairs chances are it was probably frozen in the morning 
so you made sure you used them. Feather ticks pretty good. What was your furniture like in the house? Well, it's like the old furniture that you see at the antique stores today. You know, the old uh, uh, chairs with the uh, rounded tops on them, and and uh, they were wood. No, nothing soft about them. Uh, the table was the table that. Uh, uh, had wheels under it, and as I recall, you could make it into a larger, longer table with uh, added pieces in between in the front, uh, middle. Uh, the living room, there was no such a thing as a Davenport. Uh, they were just uh, chairs. Uh, some of the chairs probably had a little padding on it. Uh, one rocking chair, I recall. Uh, there was also a, uh, a stove in there. Uh, which was a coal stove, just a, like a space heater kind of a thing. The kitchen had a regular uh, coal kitchen range in it. Uh, bedrooms, of course, were the old metal tube type uh, bed frames. No box springs or anything like that. It was, just, it was a spring and a mattress on top of it. That's about it. Where did you get your coal from? Uh, my dad, he got the coal from Fredonia, uh, which was the local elevator there. Uh, and they, of course, they handled grains and coals and that type of thing at those days. And my dad was uh, one that he always wanted those little, he, they called them briquettes, which was a little pressed coal, uh, or like, look like little tiny pillows, like about Oh, I don't know, about five inches square or something like that, you know, and maybe about three or four inches thick. And he liked those rather than those old, the, instead of the lignite, which he says, they always create too many clinkers in there, you know, so he didn't like that stuff. So he always wanted those. And I recall in the fall of the year, uh, <clears throat> that was before, before they bought a truck, uh, he would hitch this uh, trailer onto the car and they would uh, fill this, uh, it was a 50 bushel box, if you put grain in it, uh, box, and they took, went to town, they filled that maybe about a half of coal. Now, I don't know, was it because of the weight of it or whatever that, I don't know. But anyway, every time they drove to town, they took some coal along home. And of course, those were pitched down into the basement. And of course, during the winter time, why they would get lifted with buckets up to stairs. And there was a coal bucket by every stove and they would uh, feed the coal in the furnace that way, or in, the, in the, these kitchen kitchen stoves and living room stoves. Whose job was it to feed the fires? Usually my dad took care of that. He watched that. How often would you, would your family entertain guests in your home? Not too often that I recall. Not too often. Um, do you remember any instances when people were entertained? Yes. I remember an incident during the winter, and I don't know what month it might have been, but uh, we had an ice cream freezer, and I don't know how many people were there, not too many, I don't suppose. But uh, for some reason or other, this old ice cream freezer uh, got filled too much with salt and water and whatever, and it leaked into the ice cream. And, well, ice cream's done. Everybody, you know, had a dish, and boy, they pitched in the ice cream. Boy, this ice cream tastes funny. Did you put sugar in? Boy, it tastes salty. And they finally found out that it had too much ice in it. And I remember that instance. So, yeah, that was kind of a joke for quite a while, that I recall. Went to the Rudolph Street to eat salty ice cream. You mentioned several times that your your father spoke English and you, or German, mm -hmm. and uh, spoke a lot of German at home. Were you allowed to speak English at home? Sure. Yeah. They didn't really say you got to speak English or something, but in a roundabout way, when I think back on it, uh, they encouraged you to speak English. I mean, my dad's thoughts now. Uh, I came from Germany. You know, to a new place, you know, and his dad you know, came to a new place, and uh, you gave up your uh, 
uh, rights to where you came from and you're, you're in a new country, you do what is in this new country. Uh, you speak uh, the English language, you try to write English, you, you know, do, do this type of a thing. So okay. they had pride in it. There was a pride in it. There, were, uh, there wasn't such a thing as having pride in, in speaking German uh, if you could speak English. You, you tried to convert yourself into English. Where did you go to the bathroom at your old house? Outside. Outside. So you, you know, even even the time came along, if you thought you maybe had an urge, you went before you went to bed outside. You bet. Could you describe the outhouse for us? Oh yeah, it was a two-holder. Uh, and it, uh, it wasn't uh, that uh, it had good sidings on it. You could see cracks through it, you know, if you were sitting there. Look to see a crack through. Somebody was driving through the yard or whatever. You know, you could see who it was. You know, yeah, it was it was well well ventilated. Oh, um, could you tell us a little bit about your bath, such as how often did you take a bath or that type of thing? Well, usually it was on a Saturday, Saturday evening, and that was in a uh, in a tub of sorts, which probably held oh I don't know probably lucky if it held five gallons of water. And, uh, you know, the youngest one got a bath first, and then whoever came along next, he was the next older one went in there, and I, I suppose by the time the oldest ones got in there, which we weren't around anymore, they probably had a fresh shot of new water, but uh, the, old, the younger ones, we all had the same water. Okay. Did you make your own soap? Do you oh, yes, mother made her own soap. You bet. Do you remember how she made that? No, not for sure. Uh, I do. Re the only thing I recall a little bit is uh, during the time when the butchering was done. There was something about uh, the lard or rendering or something. There was some animal fat that was used of sorts, and uh, uh, there was also when the during the process. And that I don't know what the process was anymore, but I do recall that they put in a chemical, this lye, L Y E, that was mixed in. And now, uh, I don't know for certain, 100%, whether that was used in daily hand washing uh, and face washing or hair washing or whatever, but I do know for sure that it was used when they washed clothes. And mother would, you know, have this one cake of this material uh, and a, a knife and she would shave off however much she thought was enough for the, for the washing machine. How did you heat the water for the baths? <clears throat> on the cook stove. That was cooked on the cook stove, yeah. Especially in large quantities. It was, you know, maybe a whole bucket pail of sorts was sitting on the on the stove. Maybe, you know, if, okay, if you had baths on Saturday night, for instance, uh, that bucket was probably set on that stove maybe 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so to be sure it was warm. Um, in the wintertime, it worked pretty good because we had a reservoir on our kitchen range which held, I suppose, oh, maybe, oh, maybe 15 gallons or something like that. And of course, in the wintertime when the stove was going, that would automatically have warm water. You know? But in summertime, that didn't always work. How often were you supposed to brush your teeth? I don't recall that it, that was ever mentioned. And I don't recall brushing my teeth when I was a little kid. Uh, when that first started, I really don't even know. I would suspect probably shortly after first grade, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Might have been. Who and where were the meals usually prepared? Well, when my mother was still alive, she was the one that prepared the meals, served them in the kitchen, morning, noon, and night. <clears throat> After she passed away, of course, then my second oldest sister, who was still home at that time, uh, she was pretty much kind of in charge of the cooking things. And of course, after she got married, then, you know, then it, the burden was more on my dad. And of course, during that time, he was filling in because when we walked to school, you know, there was nobody home at noon. So it was, uh, you know, he had to do something at noon, so he did it at noontime. 
did you store food to keep it cool during the summer months? Uh, the perishables, uh, such as butter, for one thing, and milk, uh, they, everybody had a habit of having a pail of kind with a long rope, and that was let down into the well, however far down the water was where it was cooler. And of course, when the time came when you needed butter or milk or whatever, this was pulled up, you know, and, and used. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't hanging in the water, but I don't know how I, they had it figured out how far down the water was, and so they would let it down to close to where the water was at, and that's how they kept that. But other perishables, uh, you know, meats or whatever, to keep a long period of time, that was no, you didn't do that. Uh, anything that was uh, of that sort was uh, probably. Uh, well, you, you butchered in the fall of the year, so whatever was left was in the locker plants areas. And so, you know, uh, next week, whatever we needed, uh, whatever, so when you get to town, you stop at the locker plant and you bring home this, you know, but not so much, only, you know, whatever it was needed, they needed it. <coughs> and a lot of canning was done, too. A lot of that was done, sausages especially. Uh, there was always, you know, go downstairs and get some sausage up, you know. So, came a and other meats were canned too, chicken and beef and whatever. <coughs> Do you recall the canning process for those? No, well I recall, you know, that uh, the, the chars were washed good and proper, I recall that. Uh, whatever meats were put in, uh, if there was any seasoning put in that, I don't recall uh, anything like that, and then they were they were put in uh, these glasses, uh, and I don't know whether the, whether the lids were turned tight or not. My suspicion is, is, is they probably were not turned, you know, just snug a little bit, because you have to have the expansion and stuff like that. See? So when the water was heated for these six jars of, of whatever meats that were in, they heated them till I suppose they knew when the meat was cooked. And uh, when that point in time came, when the jars were taken out, and then they turned real tight, see, to hold that back. And so then when they cooled off, they really sucked themselves tight. And of course, then it was canned, see, so they, when it was cool, they took it downstairs. Okay. And the vegetables were done that way too, beets. And, uh, cucumbers, not. Those were, uh, they had a special brine, salt brine, and all kinds of different spices were added, and then hot water was poured on them. And when that was done, then they cranked the lids on tight. Okay. And some worked, some didn't, you know. How would your family have their meals? Um, where would you sit and did you have assigned seats? Uh, most of the time uh, the room that the kitchen table was in, uh, it wasn't a very, very big room, but uh, and chairs were limited, so there was a bench that held uh, usually about three of us. And we were sitting on the side of the table, which was the longest. So the bench people were sitting there, myself, my brother, and usually my little brother. And then and the others were my dad and my mother and, uh, well, my sister. The other one had been married already, but the one sister was home. They sat at the other sides. Okay. <clears throat> what types of food did your family usually eat? Well, usually the potatoes and breads and, and sausage or meats or something like that, chicken, uh, dumplings probably, and chicken and dumplings, that kind of a thing. Breakfast, uh, there wasn't such a thing as toast. Uh, later on, and I don't know how my sister did it, uh, I know they put, uh, they put bread into the oven a length of period of time, and it got brown, and apparently that was supposed to be toast, which, which was all right, you know. What were some of your favorite meals? Oh, chicken and dumplings. Especially if that chicken was kind of a creamed chicken. That was really good. What were some of your least favorite meals? Well, there's a little story that is from one of the nieces, uh, the nieces' children. And he was told to eat this particular meat. He says, I don't like white meat. And what that white meat was, was a piece of fat, you know, of a steak, you know, that normal people cut off. And his grandfather told him, he says, you better eat that white meat. He says, I don't like white meat. 
And so in my case, I, you know, I didn't particularly care for fats as well, you know. What were the traditional German dishes that you ate growing up? Well, I know we had cabbages, uh, and krauts, you know, uh, uh, like a sausage and a kraut, uh, and potato type of a concoction. Uh, well, any, anytime you have any kraut with, with any kind of meat, that's considered a German type of a dish, really. Whether it really is or not, who knows, but crowd was a good one. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, having ice cream around. Did your family make their own ice cream? Yes. Do you remember that process? Well, that didn't happen very often, but it's with the old ice cream freezer, you know, and that was usually in the wintertime then. In the summertime, very rarely, uh, when we did get a chance to go along to town, uh, we were probably treated to an ice cream cone which was a nickel at the time, and that was a big deal. Okay. When you made it at your house, do you remember um, the process of making it? Oh yes, you had a crank. You were one of the partners that made the ice cream, you had to turn the crank. Uh, the ingredients, I don't recall what, what they put in there, but uh, whatever ingredients were mixed in, and when that part was done, they, I suppose, I'm sure it was probably my mother or my sister, whichever, they they poured the stuff into this gallon container with the the what do you call that turner thing inside that dasher they call it a dasher you know that keeps turning around inside and the container goes around the other way and uh, put that in there and after that was in the ice was packed in there with salt and and whatever and then you started cranking you cranked for five minutes maybe the next person took five minutes and or maybe some cases somebody thought five minutes wasn't long enough, so you had to crank ten minutes, you know. But you kept cranking, everybody took a turn of cranking and until it was pretty hard to turn, and then they've kind of decided, well, you know, a little while longer, then it should be done. So that's how it came about. But summertime, you didn't have this because you didn't have no ice, you didn't have no snow, you know, that kind of thing, so. What was your family's attitude towards alcohol? Looked down upon. Moderation was fine, but uh, there were a few neighbors who enjoyed it, so uh, you know it wasn't the greatest thing in the world. Okay. I mean, if they were doing their thing, let them do their thing, but uh, our family didn't do that. You know. Did your family make their own uh, root beer or regular beer? Or yes, wine? Yep. mother did. She made wines, she made uh, beers and root beers and all that kind of stuff, but it, when you had some of that, it was very limited. Maybe on a Sunday dinner, it was probably just a little jigger. Uh, or when, when, there was, when there was company, everybody probably got a little jigger. But after that, it was put away and it stayed away until there might have been a few guests or something. Do you remember um, how she made any of those things? No, I don't. Okay. Let's uh, talk a little bit about clothing. What type of clothes were common when you were growing up? Uh, we had bib overhauls, and uh, the those uh, grayish-looking uh, shirts that matched the, the overhauls, of course. Uh, shoes were the uh, tie shoes with what about? Oh, I'd say maybe about five five eyelets on the. On each side with strings, you know, that you tie them, something like that. In the summertime, you didn't wear socks, you just wore shoes. And wintertime came along, then you got, got to wear socks. Were these clothes um, store bought or were they made? No, they were store bought. Yeah. Never had any t shirts or shorts. It was shirt and pants. When would you get um, your clothes? <clears throat> Usually in the fall of the year. Uh, I don't recall much of it uh, prior to going to school, but when, when I started going to school, then I recall uh, that uh, we went to town and we got, you know, a pair of overhauls, or those bib overhauls, and a shirt, 
Shoes, probably not, if they didn't have any holes and you didn't get any shoes. But you got some socks that you only wore if needed when it was cold. Did you ever have to wear hand-me-downs? Oh yes, did that too. Yep. One hand-me-down that I remember is, you know, were pants that uh, were too short. And uh, going out into the field for shocking and here these stubbles would picker your legs and that was painful. Does anyone in your family sew, embroider, or quilt, is it? No. No, just, just the normal mending of clothes. That's all was done. <clears throat> and even I do some of that sometimes. When a, seam, when a seam comes apart, you know, do it right away before it goes all the way. When did your family get electricity? Uh, it was in about 19... Oh God, I'd say about 1948, 47, somewhere in that neighborhood, maybe a little bit earlier, which was commercial electricity now. We had electricity on our farmstead uh, in about 1945. Uh, we had, uh, Dad had, had a 36 volt generator system that uh, he got and had the house and the barn wired and uh, we had these 16 large batteries down in the basement with a generator motor driven thing that would every so often he'd have to charge charge the batteries so that was the 36 32 volt system and we had that for maybe about two years three years and then that system was converted into a 110 volt system with a motor and generator but not the bank of batteries anymore. Uh, when you turned on the light switch, that motor electrically was activated, which was out in the garage. It was activated, and uh, the motor would start up and provide you electricity. And that system, we had that system until the REA came through in our area, I think it was in about 1940, 40, 48 or 49, somewhere in that neighborhood is when the REA came through and then of course that time the generator system was put on the back burner. Was the generator system before um, commercial electricity, was that common or were you kind of an exception uh, to the area? <clears throat> it was not very common. There were a few other individuals around who had that. Some of them had the wind charger type of a thing. Uh, which was also used to charge the batteries, which was a 32-volt system, I think. Uh, there were, uh, oh, I don't know, in our immediate area, there was probably about three of them or something that had that kind of a system. As far as the motor generator thing, uh, there were probably also maybe about two or three of them in the area that had that. In fact, I wrote a little article uh, a few years back, which is on NDSU's uh, history stuff. There's an article in there about that. A friend of mine who grew up in the Streeter area, now lives in Redland, California, uh, asked me some time back that he had a call from somebody, and he didn't say who it was. He probably knew, but he didn't say. Asked him to write what he remembers the transition from the gas lanterns to electricity. And he told me, he said, why don't you write something, you know, about that period of time. What I remember, I said, oh, God, I, said, I don't remember too much other than a few things. He said, you write them down, he says, and I'll write down what I remember and we'll exchange. And maybe between the two of us, we'll remember a few more things after that. So we did that for I don't know, a couple of months, we did that. And every time I thought of something else, and he did too. And so when we were at the point where we thought, can't remember anything more. So we submitted it, and little did I know that it's going to wind up at NDSU, the Germans for Russian Heritage Site. So it's on there. Electricity, uh, I think it's Electricity in Ferdonia by my name, Orion Rudolph, and his is Electricity in Streeter by Don Huffman. So if you're interested in that, why, 
That's a site to go look. There's, there, t there we talk about that electricity business. Okay. Um, if you could, could you share with us a little bit about how electricity changed your life? Well, uh, we didn't have to have the uh, uh, crank the old separator anymore. You know, there's a motor provided on the separator, so it run the same speed and the right speed that it's supposed to run. So that was a help there. Uh, we had uh, a big yard light out in the middle of the yard. So in the evening time, there, you know, there's light around the yard. Every building that you went into that was wired had light. Our old outhouse had a light which made it nice in the evening, in the winter time, we had light. Uh, the house, you know, had light in every room. The washing machine had electric, uh, electric motor now. The, the motor generators were no longer there to run at night or, you know, to generate the electricity for the batteries or the other 110 volt system. Um, I don't recall if there was a battery charger available at that time or not, but I know my brother, he rigged up a, a electric motor with a generator that was uh, either removed from a tractor or a car or I don't know where the generator came from, but it was a generator that was normally used on a vehicle. He rigged that up in such a fashion so he could generate electricity for a battery that needed to be recharged, which was really neat, you know plugged it in and here we had a generator running to charge up the battery. So yeah, that electricity did wonders. When did your family get its first car or truck? Uh, the first modern car, so to speak, was in 1936. That was a Chevrolet. But uh, my parents had a Model T Ford too, but I don't remember when they got that. Uh, but that was their actual first car that they had. It was a Model T Ford. Uh, I don't recall anything of that uh, other than the family talking about it. But I do remember the 1936 Chevy. I remember that. And that's the one we used to drive to Aberdeen when my mother was sick. And then after that, let's see, 36 Chevy, what did he have next? We got a, uh, it was a Plymouth. I don't remember what what brand Plymouth it was, but it was a Plymouth next, and then there was a Chrysler after that, and, and in the meantime, in between there, someplace along the trail, we got an international truck, and that was about a ton and a half truck. Uh, my brother tells me that my dad never drove that truck. They bought it in Jamestown, and my brother drove it home, and, and he says, my dad never drove that truck. It was just too big of a thing for him to drive. I wonder what he would have thought of a big semi-truck today. When did your family get a telephone? Our first telephone one phone came when we were living in Fredonia. Uh, so that would have been, uh, well, we moved in town in 1949, and uh, we didn't have telephone for the first year or two or three even. So it was probably about 1951, 52 in there somewhere when we got our first phone. How did this change your family's life? Well, that was pretty neat. You didn't have to run to the neighbors to talk. You just ring them up on the phone. Yeah, you bet. It's pretty nice. Um, did they have the old switchboard type of operation? No, at that time it was already pretty much like what we have today. You didn't have to go through an operator or anything, unless you wanted to make a long distance call. Then you had to go through the operator. But uh, other than that, just local calls. You know, just dial the phone number and be done with it. Usually it was a four-digit number. You didn't have this seven-digit number like you have today. <coughs> you mentioned earlier um, listening to some of your favorite radio programs. <coughs> was radio very important to your family? Uh, not so terribly important, no. Uh, other than maybe the weather report, if there was such a thing on there. <coughs> okay. So, how move over to environment <coughs> for a little bit. What was it like growing up on the plains? Well, <clears throat> you were sheltered for the most part of all the, all the fast activities that uh, are in, in larger cities. Uh, you were sheltered to the point you, were, you didn't even know it, uh, which I think is probably a good thing 
because uh, when you compare the sheltered life with people that are exposed to whatever goes on in large cities, uh, I don't miss it at all. I, I'd much sooner take the sheltered life. No. <clears throat> what did you find beautiful or enjoyable about growing up on the plains? Well, you could go outside, do whatever you wanted to. For the most part, you could go catch gophers or uh, play with your siblings uh, and stuff like that. Uh, there was nobody watching if you, well, I don't think it ever happened, but uh, you run outside without pants, for instance, it wouldn't have bothered anybody. Uh, I don't think that ever happened, but it, you know, you could have done that. Uh, I'm sure in the summertime we ran around without shirts, you know, and even without shoes. You know, that was no big deal. What did you find bleak or unpleasant about growing up on the plains? I don't think I really find anything bleak. Uh, I think for the most part everything was pretty good as far as I know. Uh, I think so anyway. <clears throat> Whether we missed a whole lot of things, who knows, you know. If we did, I don't know about it, and what you don't know don't hurt you. Um, you touched a little bit about um, the snow in the winter blocking your road. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about the winters, what they were like? Well, <clears throat> we did have uh, days once in a while, just like we have today's days, when you have a two or three day blizzard, you have that kind of a thing. And we had those in those days. Um, usually when, uh, when, when there was a day coming along like that, I don't know how Dad knew, but he said, uh, you know, I've got a feeling, and according to the weather, the way it sounds, he says, I think in a few days we're going to have a blizzard. We better get the hay box going and get some hay, uh, you know, additional hay for the hay mound and stuff like that, which they did, my brother and him, my dad, they, they would haul home hay from a nearby haystack, which was probably a quarter of a mile away, or maybe more, I don't know. And uh, sure enough, uh, maybe the day before, when they were still hauling some extra hay home, just uh, for insurance purposes, uh, a very quiet day, sunny, but it was quiet, and not really cold, cold, but it was cold. And uh, when they were unloading this hay, my dad says, listen, he says, you can hear the steam train uh, stream whistle blowing in Fredonia, which is about eight miles away. That's how quiet it was. And you could hear the train, because there were two trains in the morning and in the afternoon. And it was steam, steam whistling. You could hear that. He says, rest assured, he says, there's going to be bad weather coming. And it was a day or two later, blizzard and they all get out. So, I mean, there was different methods that people used in those days, and I don't know how accurate they were, but... Uh, some people, they, they were right on it, you know. Then I recall one incident. This old, an old fellow that, uh, when the roads were open, uh, and we walk into school that one mile, uh, if the direction was the right way if in the morning, it didn't happen very often, but in the evening, it happened when you were walking home. He would come along, and he had an old truck. Uh, he took the duels off driving along, and uh, he would all stop and give you a ride home. And a lot of times, you know, we could tell he had been liquored up because you could smell it. We knew that much already. Well, anyway, during the winter one time, he came going to town, and the roads were blocked that particular mile where we always walked to school. And uh, so the trail was, uh, when they came from the westerly direction, <clears throat> they drove <clears throat> into our yard our gated yard there were off the road and uh, then they would start kitty corner across the pastures and stuff like that. Well this particular time there was a bunch of snow that was bothersome there where they drive in. And it was bothersome enough to the point where he got stuck. And my brother went down to help him shovel. It was in the morning. And while they were shoveling trying to get out you know and, and uh, this old man he was unhappy. Of course I called him old man he wasn't probably he was probably 30 years old or something at that time, or 40 maybe. Uh, my brother made some suggestion. He said, oh, he says, you know, he says, we should just burn this snow. And he says, the old man stopped right with the shovel and stuck it in the ground. He says, young man, he says, don't ever wish that. He says, there would be a hell of a fire once in a while, he says. <laughs>
So that's some of the snow stories. Okay. Could you describe a typical fall for us? Uh, yeah, there was the uh, the fall was the the harvesting of the grains, the bindering. Uh, if the grains were too short, and there was the headering. And of course, after that process, well, then you know when the threshing crew came by, the threshing business was going on. Everybody was involved with uh, with the threshing, the hauling the bundles in, and the uh, the housewives uh, and whoever was capable of helping, they were to prepare the meals for the usually the supper meal. The dinners were usually hauled out to the farmers uh, and stuff like that. So not very often that there was any grain hauled to town. It was all stored at home. What was what were your summers typically like? Well, there was haymaking time. Uh, me personally, I didn't get involved because I was a little bit too young. Uh, there was haymaking time when uh, my dad, he would uh, cut hay with the horses, an old horse mower, which was only probably about a seven foot cutter bar, and uh, he would mow. And then, of course, the, the raking of the hay into windrows, and then they would uh, push these windrows together and put them on haystacks and stuff like that. But uh, I was a little bit too young to get involved in that. The only little teeny bit I got involved in it was, was the hay raking and that was not much at all, maybe a couple of days. Uh, because I was just, I was just literally too young to uh, sit on that hay dump rake. And uh, I thought I could really do it because they said, you know, all you have to do is get you up. When you get to the place where the rest of the hay is, you just press this handle down and it'll dump and you keep going. Well, I think I can do that. So I, I got on this dump rig and get up. We were going on pretty soon, got to this place where it's where the dump was supposed to dump. I couldn't, I didn't have enough power. You know, I, I was too weight, too, too lightweight. And I couldn't quit that thing down. So Purdy said, oh, you know, and by that time I had drug the hay 10, 15 feet further than it should have been. Well, then after the horses stopped, I kept trying and then it went pretty easy. Well, how come, you know, okay. It dumped right there, and I kept on going. So when I got to the next one, I still couldn't press it. So I, that bunch again, I pulled 10, 15 feet further than I should have. And got the horses to stop, and then I pressed it. And it, I thought, oh, pretty soon I got a little smarter. When I got to the next one, right where it's supposed to be dumped, I told the horses to stop. I pressed this thing down, everything worked fine. Well, so now I got it figured out, I thought. And, uh, well, coming around the next way, doing the same thing, you know, just had the horses stop every time, and I got the thing in. But because I wasn't strong enough. Well, this, I think this was during noon hour, because everybody was left, and I was out in the field with the two horses and dump rig. And uh, I was, it was kind of a lucky thing, because I was real close by, a, by the road in our farmstead where we were at. And uh, all of a sudden, I get to looking down there, and one of these, these uh, things that is hitched from the horse's harness to the, to the hay rake, two from each horse, the inside one was unhitched, and of course that was pulling it sideways. And there was no way that I was going to get down between those horses to hitch that thing on there. So, well, then I just, you know, I sat on the hay rake there and just waited for something. You know, to figure there should be coming from the homestead pretty soon. Well, as luck would have it, there was a lady that came driving along, and the road was not very far away, you know. And I waved and waved, and this lady stopped. And she hollered out in German, Boy, Schloss, what's wrong? And I said, this strap is unhitched here from, she said, well, hitch it on. Uh-uh, I'm not going to go in there. And so she gets out of her car and she walks over there too. You know, and she walks behind that horse and reaches around back there and grabs this thing and hitches it on again. Just like as if nothing ever happened. But there was no way that I was going to go behind those horses' legs and do that again. And I've never been a really a horse person. And I don't know, because my older brother, he would, he would ride horses. Uh, but not, I, in our barn where my dad had kept the two draft horses for work horses, when you pushed the door open, the first thing you saw was this big, long leg standing there, you know. And if that door would have gone the other direction, then I could have gone in here and I could have seen those horses down the other end, which would have been fine. But those big legs always scared me. And as, maybe as a child, Growing up, I just didn't have too much love for horses, so 
as a result, I'm not much of a horse person. Because I was always visualizing, walk in that barn and this one horse would just wait for me and give me a good kick. I'd have probably flown a half a mile, you know, but that's how it is. So that's the only experience I had of working with horses on the farm. That, that little bit of noon hour thing there, which was not my bag. Okay. Could you describe a typical spring for you? Uh, I really didn't have to do anything uh, farm work uh, until, oh gosh, I might have been maybe about nine years old or eight or something like that. Uh, coming home from school one afternoon, uh, walking home, here was standing a brand new shiny E Model A tractor with the two bottom plow. And I thought that was really neat. A cute tractor, you know. I mean, it was, to me it was a big tractor, but it was a cute little tractor. And that tractor I was able to, uh, I was, you know, asked to help work with the field work in the spring of the year, of course, when school was on, I didn't, but and maybe in the evening or, or on a Saturday or something, I got a chance to plow with that tractor. And I thought that was really great. Until the first rock came along and disconnected the plow. Now what? Well, I managed to get it backed up to the place where it was at, but then I wasn't strong enough to lift that hitch to hook it onto the thing again. So there I was until my brother, who was driving the other tractor, came around the field, and here I was, you know, so I walked up there and hitched it down. He said, okay, go ahead, go. I put it in gear and took off again. Everything worked fine. So that's, that was my first experience. All right, after describing all those, what was your favorite season? Oh, gosh, gosh. They were all good. They were all pretty good, I would say. I didn't really, you know, at the time you, you when you're little like that, you don't realize the growing of the grasses and the greens and, and then uh, the actual cutting the haze and, and putting it up in, in piles, you know. Uh, sure, that's all work that needs to be done, but as far as really appreciating it when you're a little kid, you know, yeah, it's, it's work that needs to be done. Whether you're appreciating it or not, in a sense, I, I don't, I don't know. It, I, I enjoyed all of them, I guess, you could say. Um, you mentioned earlier that you didn't have any shelter belts or very many trees on your farm. No, no trees at all. Oh. I, I take that back. The tr there were a few trees, but they were not in the right location for the wind. They were downwind from us. They were cherry trees. We had a grove of cherry trees, but, you know, eighth of a mile away. But they, for winter purposes, uh, shelter belts, they didn't do nothing for us. They were the wrong side of the farm. Did you ever miss not having trees growing up? Kind of, yeah. I kind of did, yeah. And I don't know, the, the, site, the site where the farm was at was on the corner of the section. And there was a, a, a traveled road on one side, and the other side was a county line road. And, and they were too close to the buildings for one thing. Uh, so I think, and I suspect maybe my dad and mother, they probably, you know, there's not enough room for trees, you know. If the farm site would have been a half a mile in farther, yes, there would have been plenty of room. Or maybe they thought too, well, this is, there's some grass here for cattle to eat. It's not, let's not disturb it with trees. So maybe that's what's their thought, too. I don't know. Okay. What was your most stressful childhood experience? Probably when my mother passed away. What is your happiest childhood memory? Well, it was probably the time when I got done with grade school, knowing that I'm finally done with the requirements that I don't have to go to school anymore, because it was a struggle for me to make it this far. And uh, my sisters encouraged me, you better go to high school, you better go to high school. I really didn't want to. And a friend of mine who graduated from eighth grade a year earlier, he and I would run around together in Fredonia. And periodically, the question came up, you know, between the two of us, and I suppose his brothers were encouraging him to go to high school as well, because his body 
or in he's done a high school, done a grade school, the two of you guys could go together. Well, we talked about these little things periodically throughout the summer. We finally decided, well, let's try it for a couple of weeks. It's, you know, we know we don't have to go to school anymore. We, we can always quit if we don't like it. Not like grade school. So, okay, we went a couple of weeks. Well, it wasn't just so too bad. It was a couple of more weeks. Pretty soon it was a couple of more months. Next thing you know it, we were through the freshman year. Well, you know, should we go another year? Well, I think this wasn't so bad. Let's try another, you know, for a while. If we don't like it, we can always quit. We always know we don't have to go. So pretty soon we were through the sophomore year and junior year, and next thing you know, we were done with four years and we were graduates from high school. Haven't regretted it since. Okay. What was the most adventurous thing you did during your childhood? Oh, golly, I don't know. They were all adventurous days. I suppose when we went to go uh, picking cherries one Saturday afternoon at my sister's place, and uh, we were picking cherries, had a couple of, I don't know, I suppose they were milk pails or something, well, small pails anyway. We had quite a bunch of straw, uh, cherries picked already, and uh, all of a sudden here there was a snake. That was exciting. We ran. <laughs> kind of a snake was it just well to us any snake was uh, a big emotion but uh, knowing what we know today they were just a garden snake which wouldn't have hurt us any had it been a rattler or something it would have been a different thing but uh, uh, there weren't any rattlers around in our neck of the woods that I'm aware of at least not yet I don't think is there anything else about your childhood memories that you'd like to add I think that's about all I can scare out of my brains at this time. Okay. Tomorrow I might remember something else, but today I can't recall anything else. Okay. Let's get a, a few concluding um, insights and reflections from you. Why do you think it is important to tell your life story? Um, for me, it's a sense of being able to pass on to the future uh, generation experiences that uh, I have gone through and uh, that I remember my parents have gone through uh, and some of my aunts and uncles things of the, you know what was being said uh, that I can pass that on to my child the oldest one has passed away but to my child and today she's only 30 well must be getting close to 40 already uh, she's not really concerned about these things she doesn't care uh, same thing like when I was that age, that didn't phase me at all. But knowing what I know today, it would be nice if my parents, grandparents, would have thought of passing their experiences, their grandfather's experiences, on down the line, uh, which that hasn't been done. It never was done. Some families might have, but I question very much whether some of these uh, older folks did anything like that other than by word of mouth. Well, you can pass on a little bit by word of mouth. If I tell you uh, my experiences uh, for an hour, and you think, boy, I'm going to write this down when I get home. When you get home, you're probably going to remember maybe 5% of it, if that much. So it, it needs to be written down uh, to be able to pass on to your next of kin, whatever. In my case, I have written somewhere around 16 or 20 some pages, which I have uh, put down just of our family, things that we remember. And I know there is a lot more things that we could write, but when you sit at the computer, all of a sudden your mind draws a blank, and then, well, you might as well walk away from it. Uh, and whatever I have put together at this point, I have made copies, and I give it to my brother, and I gave it to my sister. And of course, the oldest sister is gone, so that's... There's, it's gone there, and same thing with my younger brother. He's gone too, so he doesn't know. They don't know anything about this, but uh, I feel good in my heart to be able to pass these things on. And as time goes on, I keep trying to get little bits and pieces together to be able to pass it on. And everybody should be doing that. Okay. Are there any other thoughts or observations you'd like to share? 
<clears throat> Thoughts and observations. Well, I suppose in my particular case, uh, my thoughts uh, go back again to preserving your family histories as much as you can uh, gather and put together. Uh, outside of the family, uh, I got myself involved, uh, which I didn't even think that I was ever going to do, but I'm glad I did, uh, was to translate the German church record books for the Lutheran church that I go to. Uh, most of those church record books had at least 90 to 95 percent the old German script. And knowing what I know today, uh, there are so few people around that are readily available to you that can translate that stuff into English for you. Uh, chances are there might be some professional people who do these kind of things. They're going to charge you an arm and a leg to get that stuff done. Uh, fortunately, it didn't cost me all that much to get uh, 17 church record books converted in English, uh, mainly because there was a lady that I got acquainted with and her dad was a pastor who wrote German script and uh, she knows this German script real well and she helped me with every one of these books. So I feel good about getting this stuff done and her encouragement from one book to the next to keep on going and that she would help translate. I could type miles and miles of paper, but it has to be translated so that I can type it. Now that it's done, <clears throat> uh, I have made discs for this and uh, I uh, have a three ring binder for every individual church record book that belongs to the Lutheran Church. When they closed the little churches, these books wound up at the church. So every church record book is available at the Lutheran Church in Ashley. Uh, a year ago, uh, I took this computer disk from these churches' records. Uh, I gave that to uh, the NDSU uh, library, the Germans from Russia Heritage Center thing. I gave them a disk for that. Now they are going to uh, redo these booklets a little bit, embellish them, put a fancy covers on them, uh, get them registered with the Library of Congress so they are copyrighted. Uh, they are in the process of uh, doing this one book they have already finished uh, and of course the process is going to go on further. Uh, there is also every booklet has a picture of the tombstone of every individual that I know of that has a tombstone at every one of the cemetery sites is in each one of these books. Uh, I feel good about doing that because there are two I know. Uh, there are church people that uh, are interested in some of these things uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, these children, grandchildren, whatever have you down the road, they may all of a sudden one day wonder about great grandpa so and so, great grandma such and such. You know, they'd like some, some history because their family has neglected to pass this information on down. So somebody in that area is going to come alive and say, oh, I'm going to do a family history book on our family. But where am I going to get this information from? Aunts and uncles are gone. I've got a few cousins. They don't remember too much. Well, now here's a little piece of evidence. If they remember that their great grandfathers probably were in the Ashley area and, uh, you know, they went to a church site that we heard of in so and so and so, if they come to the Ashley area or when all these books are on record with NDSU, they'll find some information to be able to put some of their histories together. See, So I feel good about being furthering this business along. Makes me feel good if I don't do anything else anymore. Okay. Is there anyone else? Oh, I'd like to thank you very much for spending the afternoon with us. I'm glad you came. Thank you for sharing your stories. Good. Glad you enjoyed it.